Um, I don't profess to be much of a narrator. I'm perceived as evidently the face. But I will, however, attempt, so hell with your permission, to <laughs> express my opinions freely, honestly, and applying, or rather employing, what I always do, even in my own art form, just addressing truth as simply as I can, straight from the heart. And um, I'm no authority, as Sohel rightly put, for the matter on the functioning of the industry. I belong to all the workings of it. But by virtue of being an integral part of my fraternity, it was an invitation tough to resist, Mr. Puri, and an opportunity worth, worthy of exploration. And with this experience of sharing and learning from you in turn, I'm sure I will return enriched. So while we speak on exploiting India's soft power, I prefer to approach the same with the spirit of harnessing India's soft power. Harnessing, realigning, before exploiting it to its full potential, which will always be an ongoing process in a growing country. Uh, surely a good sign. One of the eminent speakers at the conclave, Mr. Kilnani, has written a book about the idea of India. Well, I guess what I'm trying to do here is talk about the India of ideas. In broad terms, I will try to try and identify a vision of where the entertainment and media industry is, my inter interpretation of the soft power, where it should probably be heading, and what needs to fall in place to allow us to get there. Now that I'm here to give you facts and figures, Shekhar did, did that brilliantly last year. But broadly, the global entertainment and media industry saw growth in 2001, thank you, rising by 1.5% and exceeding the approximate trillion dollar mark. According to PricewaterhouseCoopers, the global entertainment and media spending will reach 1.4 trillion in 2006 for the 5.6% compound annual growth rate over the next five years. Film entertainment will play a major role in the growth of the entertainment and media sector in India. The assessed figures point to an industry that must be, surely must be, phenomenally successful. I mean, an industry churning out more than 800 films a year, all claiming to have spent decently high dollar budgets and going by sheer population and adulation world over, we are now talking millions of tickets every week. So irrespective of the pricing factor of our tickets in the different sectors and the returns therein, I tend to believe, or I'm inclined to believe, that the fractured structure of the organization of this apparently booming, thriving, multi-million or trillion dollar industry that provides for the loopholes that sometimes conveniently exist within the system, ebbing the natural trend of growth here. Indian films now reaching multilinguistic audiences the world over. This popularity will drive the Indian film entertainment business poised to grow at an approximately $1.1 billion by 2006. Besides films, we have other areas of the entertainment and media industry. Television, booming big time, broadcasting, music, despite Napster, uh, electronic media, and even the print media, all contributing to the growth of the sector in a big way in India. And since I belong to films in particular, it is interesting to note how much software films itself generate for all these areas, even evidently, dare I say, on our news channels these days. Surely, the potential of the film industry has been clearly identified for a long time now and exploited in a manner to not only fund itself, but several parallel worlds of entertainment as well within our own arena. Now just look at the meticulously executed ad campaigns here or the promos for the various films that we have releasing. That a part of this sea change with new channels of multiplexes within India and the media and television, of course, growing in our favorite word, the overseas territories. The positive outcome, banks and financial institutions coming forward to finance films, a step to its recognition as an industry. The Information and Broadcasting Ministry in India announcing a single window opened to, to facilitate proper, investor-friendly shooting regimes, globalization, software technology, 
and uh, prompting several t traditional players and industry majors to make their operations more transparent and corporatize. Film producers, financiers, distributors associates going public and getting listed at major stock exchanges. But the flip side, however, of this trend, which we need to check now, and the dangers are quite evident, is of the productions in quantity and uh, or an inclination to decline in quality. So I think this is a danger that we must check now, even though corporati uh, corporatization is definitely a positive trend. Indian films are making global impact. Fact. Lagan in the recent past, with pride I say, since I belong, <laughs> Devdas, as I saw at the Cannes Film Festival, a very recent film of mine, Choker Bali, and this I'm obviously naming films that I have been a part of, uh, so I get to see the reactions overseas in person. And that itself has been extremely encouraging and proves that there is a wonderful exposure via screenings and festivals also to our Indian films ab abroad. While on international growth, however, we must appreciate and cannot ignore how America, or rather Hollywood, has elevated film marketing to an art form, exploiting it to its full potential. They have created a culture, created a culture, dare I say, a whole way of life and marketed it brilliantly, getting the world at large to believe what to love, what to fear, what to dream about, what to hate. But I think we should also look closer home at the strength and potential of our very existing and truly rich culture, waiting to be rediscovered and strengthened on the global pupil. For me, uh, that is what probably an opportunity at Miss World, rightly said so, as several moons ago, <laughs> at, um, you know, to, to be a part of the film fraternity, which after several years, by the grace of God, gave me opportunities like representing India at the jury at the Cannes Film Festival, um, being on the cover of the Time magazine, only after India Today, uh, definitely was, uh, for me, has been a step in that direction, getting the opportunity to represent India internationally and uh, probably catalyzing the movement, which seems definitely the mood of the day. And I would like to put all the efforts that I can in my own little way to contribute to, to this mo movement of us acquiring our recognition on the international platform. While on entertainment, we couldn't possibly leave the media out. So let's talk about the media. I am in the lion's den, and I still dare to comment. Soft, while um, the media, though, clubbed in our bracket of soft powers, I recognize as quite the superpower. The role media plays is critical in shaping perceptions of the entire nation and in the larger picture on the global map. Definitely in the perception of the film industry as well, media has incredible power. But with that, you have to accept that it also has, and, it, and the media has to realize as well the responsibility that goes with that bar. The truth is that we both recognize there exists a symbiotic relationship here, and hence I think we ought to give it its due. We are here together at this forum, clubbed together as the soft bars, looking towards building India together by exploiting our potential to its best. But, I'm not, and I'm not saying this happens all the time, I mean, it, media is also responsible for propping us up here. That's why I'm here talking to you, addressing you. But at the same time, sadly, it does not, uh, we do not always seem to work together to achieve this. I'd say, dear media, be the honest friend. Wrap us on our knuckles when we need to uh, you know, address serious issues. And be the mirror in a bit to awaken reform. But. I know this seems more like a personal note here, but say, coming back to my experience at the Cannes Film Festival, um, an honor, we all recognize that. An incredible experience, I know for sure. I cherish it and treasure it for a long time to come. But sadly, and a large bracket of the media has gone ahead and documented it 
more for the reasons of supposed goof-ups by a designer rather than the opportunity itself. Not a very encouraging trend, not a, a sign that would probably give me, a normal girl who stepped in here to be a part of films, who could have very well be cocooned in the security of fame, stardom, having earned my laurels, and really not made the attempts to, to step out, to try and make a difference, to try and contribute to what we see as a positive trend of the recognition of the Indian on the global platform. So when I am willing to dare, I think what people like me could do with is a lot more encouragement and support. Truly, this attitude does get discouraging, tiring, and this is as honest as I can get. It, it, can, it can be pretty negative. And on the whole, I think this, this attitude then tends to reduce the respect of all involved in the larger picture, be it the subject, as I was speaking about myself, for example, be it the media, and most importantly, leaves a bad taste in the mouth of the audience, who, if I may remind us, we both are actually meant to inspire, to dream, and project encouragement and positivity in the search and attempt to building a prosperous nation, hopefully together. Yellow journalism cast aside, we're not saying we need to erase that, but I don't think those divisional lines need to be blurred um, all, all, all around. I don't think I can overemphasize the fact that for us to go forward and truly be a world-class source of entertainment, we need to raise our own standards, respect ourselves more, and our own more. From where I stand and I see it, there could not be a more opportune moment to promote India's industry globally. And this can only be done with support from within within our soft powers. That's precisely why at the outset I said, I address it today as harnessing our soft powers, realigning it before we actually exploit it to its fullest potential. Yes, we know historically our films have been appreciated globally. They probably empathize with our ethos, our emotions, our family values. So what better global ambassador can we boast of? Miss World set aside. The great Western myth has been created by film. But what we have is not myths. Our culture and spirituality is for real. Our need is to market our dreams and aspirations more effectively. We really need the, sup the support of the government to understand it's one of the tools to promote our own country. Over the past several years, there have been a large number of delegations from several countries that have invited us and you know, literally laid the red carpet out for us to shoot our films there. The shoots themselves don't necessarily bring in the money because we typically go with limited budgets, smaller units, most times, not necessarily looked after by very strong film fam families. But these countries recognize that Hindi films are a great medium to promote their country, attracting larger volume of tourism, serving as calling cards, in inviting us currently even for our own award functions abroad. So well, shouldn't we truly be doing this for ourselves? There are a few countries that can parallel India's geographical and cultural diversity and richness. So with the right incentives, support from the government, the soft power industries, and the superpower media, it can facilitate productions in India itself, promotion and distribution of our films, wider audiences within and overseas, combating and fighting piracy by being supportive and, of course, remembering to give the consumer what he needs, because the, the negative elements will exist, so we just have to work around it or, or fight it beyond just saying let's fight it, and um, ensuring that quality be, be upheld. So let me assure you that the idea and image of India can be truly appealing, an advert for tourism, our clothes, our culture, our wonderfully rich heritage. So to summarize, I'm sure you guys have been waiting for this. <laughs> Our vision is to create and produce successful films for good entertainment by harnessing imagination of viewers, great stories to tell, understanding the constant cultural change and segmentation of the viewers in the territories, targeting films at various levels of viewers' choices, and yet include new age cinema and new outsourced talent. 
Secondly, to corporatize and professionalize the process of filmmaking to achieve better standards of quality with constant research and development, backed with years of practical experience and effective media support, and ensure that our films maintain competitive edge whilst rapidly returning the investment. On an end note, simply to redefine soft power, because I just want to look at it with a different perspective, I think largely within the world that I belong, even the female power, the woman power would like to be, would, people would like to address that as the soft power. And it saddens me to see if we just um, address the term exploiting soft power. Um, we, we know, we lament about the exploitation of, of the female probably that exists within the entertainment medium larger than any other professional choices because obviously it's glaring and in everybody's eye and people are informed about it. But um, the sad trend that, that seems to be evident these days, and I'm, and I'm not a prude here, I'm, I'm just, this is just an open and honest dialogue, um, seems to be that um, the women entering this arena are inclined to believe uh, shedding of inhibitions or ludity is a shortcut to um, instant recall, not recognizing that that obviously has a really, really short shelf life. Um, for, for me to have made the kind of choices that I have, um, and I'm not tom toming about what I have, by God's grace, managed to achieve, it has obviously meant sticking to convictions over the years and making conscious choices. I mean, yes, I did come from this world when I stepped into film. I did come from the fashion world. But here I was using every opportunity to promote Indianness in everything that I attempted to do. Whether that meant simply since, I, since Miss World was all right, you associate that instantly first with fashion. So it meant I went ahead to promote Indian fashion at, at every uh, gathering. If it meant um, representation for me, that opportunity was more about representing the Indian woman internationally, because it was shocking to, to, to discover even in the UK, even though they, they left us a whole lot many years ago and they know the influence they left behind, they seemed surprised that I was educated in my own country. Um, when, when, it, when I joined the film industry, um, to be actually talking terms, to be actually uh, demanding scripts or talking negotiations, is um, even up until recently a constant cause for a pro, which, which I think is only a, pro a, a professional approach and that should be appreciated. Highly questionable if a female takes a stand and comes to you know, uh, having an open dialogue here and seeking to be addressed as a professional. When it came to making choices of being a part of a regional film, like Choker Bali, soon after the commercial success of Devdas, it raised a lot of many eyebrows here, wondering, now why would she do this? Is she, is, is she lacking work here? Has she lost all the opportunities? Is it, does she still look good anymore? <laughs> Sorry, I'm just having fun. But um, the point is that people did not really seek to find out that I was only looking, I mean, I, I got the perfect film, a fabulous role, a great director, but I was going ahead and lending my commercial value to what was dubbed as art or regional cinema. And yes, we did actually see the returns of it. I, in turn, as a creative person, got a fabulous film to be a part of. I enjoyed my role thoroughly. It's evoked a wonderful response world over. And today, there are a lot many people actually willing to invest in the Bengal industry, which I feel secretly thrilled to have actually catalyzed here. So it's just a question of, at different points and stages of your life, willing to make those decisions, but I think what we need to do is be allowed those opportunities, and um, with a lot more support and encouragement, uh, we can strengthen our conviction. So women are perceived as a soft power. Well, I'd just like to, via you, have the message reached to them that recognize your power and potential to the fullest, make that choice yourself to exploit it to the fullest with far-sighted approaches not allow oneself to get exploited. I know this is a fine uh, play of words here, but in a larger gamble, but, but a large gamble in the bigger picture. I thank you ever so much for your patience, for listening to me so, um, so wonderfully, patiently, and uh, I have truly enjoyed expressing myself so openly after a long time, and 
my handwritten opinions from last night. I felt I was back in school doing homework. But it, it has been wonderful. I thank you for giving me this chance, for considering me as a speaker at a wonderfully respectable forum like this. And um, I'm glad the audience here has also listened. And I, I definitely assume understand a woman in today's competitive, blossoming India and see much more here than the sari I wear today. God bless. I'd like to thank India today for inviting me to participate in this year's enclave. Yesterday, someone referred to India Today's success in imitating Time magazine. Actually, I've always thought that uh, Arun Puri was much closer to uh, the American publisher who created a magazine called Rolling Stone, <laughs> which became the mouthpiece of an entire generation. Arun captured the zeitgeist of his time by making an Indian news magazine perform the function of news television when Indians only had doodarshan. And now that so many other magazines have followed India today, he has made another smart move, this time into television because television has become the news magazine of our time. It's a remarkable example of Indian soft power at work. During the last two days, there's been a great deal of talk about power, political and economic power, military and geopolitical power. But these are all subject to change. There has been little mention until a few minutes ago uh, of the one power that doesn't change, the power of ideas. The power of human stories which are contained in books. Without books, a nation, no matter how developed, is doomed to live in the past. Ideas are the future. Ideas by their very nature are global, defying national and intellectual boundaries. So before I indulge in, in, in generalizations about the, the future, let me tell you something about myself and my business, the, uh, the invaluable but uh, precarious business of books. I work in general interest or trade publishing as opposed to uh, educational publishing. And though I am an Indian, I run six American publishing houses headed by our flagship, Alfred Knopf. In recent years, we've been acquired by a German company, which is the largest trade publisher in the world. And incidentally, after Disney and Time Warner, the largest media company in the world. The Knopf Group, where I work, publishes writers from over 100 different countries. Our authors either write in English or are translated into English. And given the recent demographic changes in the United States, increasingly into Spanish. We launch about 520 new titles every year. Unfortunately, in the United States alone, over 100,000 new books are published annually. True, half of them are about fly fishing or golf or endless variations in the Dr. Atkins diet. <laughs> but the other half form our direct competition. Now, every time I think of these figures, I'm reminded of my arrival in the United States to take over what uh, has been called the most prestigious literary house in America. After all, in its mere 90 years of existence, Knopf authors have won countless literary awards, among them 34 Nobel Prizes for Literature, 88 Pulitzer Prizes, 30-odd Booker Prizes, 60 National Book Awards, and many, many others. In its entire distinguished history, the house uh, has had only three chiefs, uh, Alfred Knopf, the legendary founder, his successor, and, and then um, myself, a stranger who, um, 
who came from British, not American publishing, and worse, a stranger who was uh, an Indian. Articles in the American press at that time reflected a sense of unease at placing one of America's most highly regarded cultural institutions with this power to influence American thinking in the hands of such a patent foreigner. Furthermore, I looked like a foreigner too. This was brought home to me during my first month in the, in the States, in those early weeks in order to acquaint myself with my a new world before anyone arrived at work, I reached my office at the top of a Manhattan skyscraper uh, at six o'clock or thereabouts every morning. The only other person in the building at that time was a cleaning woman who was too busy vacuuming the carpets to, uh, to notice me. But then, to my surprise, one morning she suddenly appeared in front of my desk. Wagging a finger at me, she said, boy, one day someone's going to get here early. They're going to find you sitting behind that desk, and then you're going to be in big, big trouble. <laughs> she, um, she'd assumed that I was uh, a messenger, or uh, a messenger boy with delusions of grandeur. Happily, I was able to reassure her that it was OK. I had a good cover story. But after many years as a book publisher, I know that's all it was, a, a good cover story. Let me explain what I mean. Let me describe what publishing 520 new books, which is to say two new books every working day of the year, what it actually entails. Well, since each book is an entirely new product, which must be designed, packaged, and marketed individually, it's rather like launching two new newspapers or two new magazines every single day, but without any advertising revenue or subscriptions. So we have nothing to help us offlay the costs of physically producing a book, or the costs of selling a book, or the costs of piloting a book through the editorial design and legal processes. As you can see, it's an industry without much of a financial safety net. Our problems are further compounded by the demand for ever larger advances from authors and agents. But what is an advance? Well, it's merely what we pay an author against expected sales. That is to say, we pay large sums of money for a book that no one has yet bought and without guarantees that it will be bought. And when we sign multi-book contracts, we often pay these large sums of money for books that have not yet even been written. Add to that the worst anxiety of all. Distributors take our books on a sale or return basis. Nobody confesses the truth, but many books including so-called bestsellers, get shipped back, leaving publishers to swallow the costs. Now, this brutal fact was brought home to me a few months after I arrived in New York, when I visited our warehouses. It was a particularly cold winter. Fuel prices had recently gone up. So I was grateful that the warehouses had excellent heating. Then I noticed that the furnaces were being stoked with copies of returned books. Since we'd already paid for all these unsold books, I was told that this was much cheaper than buying fuel. I've often wished I could share that experience with some of our more demanding authors and their agents. Uh, for all these reasons, it seems to me that publishing can hardly be called a sane business. It is more an act of faith a constant skating on thin ice. But that's actually what makes it fun. And like all such endeavors, we have our secrets. Most people think the secret of, to publishing is finding writers. The truth is, there is no shortage of writers. When I entered the industry, the total number of new books published annually in America and all the Commonwealth countries put together were less than the number of new books published each year in either Britain or the United States today. 
In my opinion, publishing's real secret is this, finding the new reader. So you can imagine my dismay when I attended a banquet honoring a writer in San Francisco at the very height of the dot-com boom. That night, sitting at the table were a number of CEOs of information tech companies. One of these titans apologized for not having read any of the writer's books, saying, but I don't read books anymore. I don't think anyone else at this table does either. Anything we want, we get off the internet. Listening to his words, my blood ran cold. And not for the first time. The end of the book has often been announced. When I was a student at Cambridge University, the great buzzwords at the time were, the medium is the message. And messages were coming in from every medium. At one college, Watson and Crick had recently formulated their great double helix and the discovery of DNA and RNA were opening up new vistas of biotechnology. Down the road, Stephen Hawking was in his physics lab, getting ready to challenge Einstein. Alan Turing's rudimentary computer experiments were, were being expanded by the mathematics scholars who were already imagining an incredible future for what we today take for granted as the information highway. Who in this brave, truly new world was going to have the inclination to read a book? After I'd been working and publishing for some time, the death of the book was announced again. But this time, recorded books were going to replace books because we were all too busy to read. Instead, we'd be sliding books into our car tape recorders on the way to work or listening to them through our headphones while we perfected our bodies at the gym. Fortunately, the audiobook proved an inadequate substitute for actual books, and publishers breathed a sigh of relief. And then a decade later, CD-ROMs were supposed to make books obsolete, until we discovered the costs were prohibitive, and also that people wanted to read in bed, as well as sitting in front of their computers. Another 10 years, and real books were going to be replaced by e-books. And guess what? We're still waiting. At the best, these are only alternative formats of the book. Most recently, we were told the younger generation is so wedded to their computer games and their internet chat sites and their cell phones that they'll never, ever read a book again. Then this Philistine generation of children began using their chat rooms and their text messages to alert each other to a spectacular new phenomenon, the book. Suddenly, astonished parents were being dragged into, book, into bookstores to buy the new Harry Potter. So my answer to the infotech titan who never reads a book would be this. The kids waiting breathlessly for the new Harry Potter understand clearly that technology is one thing but the imagination is something else. Books still pro provide a matchless form of entertainment, an endless fund of human stories, illumin illuminating the multiplicities and diversities of our world. They also provide power. After all, mere access to facts is not power. Or else, to paraphrase the poet T.S. Eliot, wisdom would be reduced to knowledge, and knowledge turned into mere information. True power lies in the ability to think, the capacity to understand knowledge, and this is acquired, but this is not acquired through technology, but from books, from libraries, those treasuries of human experience available to all of us through the engaged imagination and the desire to enlighten ourselves. But how does any of this relate to India in this new century? How does it relate to India 2020 or India 2050? Well, let's speculate on what could happen to India's books and publishers in 40 odd years. Looking into my crystal ball, I can see an Indian publisher 
revolutionizing the way people read, making books so cheap they are accessible to the poor. I can see a profoundly Indian writer whose work is widely admired at home, winning the, the Nobel Prize for Literature abroad. I can see poets and short story writers writing in Indian languages who are quoted the length and breadth of India despite the so-called language barrier. Writers who succeed in making India's changing society comprehensible to all human beings faced with a changing world. I can see Nobel Prize winners from the West collaborating with Indian scholars on translations of India's great sacred texts. Now, hearing this, you might accuse me of being mesmerized by all the current talk of India shining, the feel-good factor. I might, be temp I might be tempted to agree, except for one thing. I was not describing India 2020 or 2050. I was describing 1920 or 1950, a time when an Indian, Krishna Menon, was instrumental in creating Pelican books so the world's greatest nonfiction could be sold for the equivalent of one rupee, making knowledge available to those unable to attend university. A time when the Irish Nobel laureate W.B. Yeats collabor collaborated with Swami Purohit on translations of the Gita and the Upanishads. A time when the poems of Fez and, and Tagore were known throughout India, although the first wrote in Urdu and the second in Bengali, and long before Tagore won the Nobel Prize for Literature. A time when Hindi writers like Prem Chand were familiar household names, and novelists such as Mulk Rajanand or G. V. Dasani, or the late great R. K. Narayan, though they wrote in English, were explaining India not just to Indians, but to the world. Today, a century later, nothing should prevent India from expanding such a base. For one thing, the timing could not be better. The world is increasingly interested in India and by the narratives coming from this great storytelling civilization. At the same time, the Indian diaspora is giving an exciting contemporary dimension to India's stories. Such narratives create what the techies call content. In our technological age, there's an insatiable demand for content, and Indians both inside and outside India are proving equal to that demand. Indian writers and their counterparts from Pakistan from Sri Lanka and Bangladesh are creating a body of subcontinental literature which has gained much international attention. That attention is, created, is creating a new generation of Indian readers at home. Those readers are being serviced by increasing numbers of new Indian bookstores while Indian publishing is at last moving into its proper function, the commissioning of new work. Such energy is attracting more and more foreign publishers into India. All this is the good news. Miraculously, Indians still love reading. A recent survey by the Indian Market Research Bureau revealed that after listening to music and watching television, the third most popular activity for India's expanding middle class is reading books. India's ik. You're not going to believe this, but in my rush to get over here, I appear to have left two pages behind. Um, I don't quite know how I'm going to do this, but how did I do that? Anyway, what I, the, the missing pages contain an unbelievable amount of statistical information on, uh, on how the Indian book market has changed and, and is, is changing. Um, and, 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 and suggests, among other things, various ways in which one could uh, 
challenge uh, people to read more. Raising book awareness is, is actually the principal question, as, as, as my uh, colleague over here uh, mentioned. Uh, marketing is one of the, the key bits, and uh, finding readers is the principal challenge that we all face. Um, And this challenge is, the challenge that Indian publishers face essentially is finding readers that are more than, of, of more than 2,000 copies for a book, uh, which is way, way beyond, below what the st statistics indicate it really should be. And central to all of this is the idea of, is the notion of having to increase one there are two things one has to deal with. One, I think, is to lower the postal rates so that books can reach people when, when they cannot reach bookstores. And the other, and this is the single most important thing, which is the problem of what we do with our libraries, because without libraries, absolutely nothing is possible. Um, raising book awareness in some way or the other has got to be done to force a reform in the, in, in, in the third vital area, which is the area of Indian book retailing. Retailers can take a trick or two from other countries to remind people how exciting books really are. For instance, some years ago, the television, American television star Oprah Winfrey created a monthly television book club where everyone in her audience had to read and discuss a book she had chosen. The show had such a dramatic impact on book sales that it is now imitated on all the major US television channels, and even in Britain. Can you imagine what would happen if someone like, say, Amitabh Bachchan or Miss Ray were to have a similar program on Indian television today? Then again, many American towns and cities, sometimes even whole states, decided to choose one book each season, not necessarily a new book that everyone would read. Radio broadcasts and local television networks publicize the book. People become so passionate about these reading projects, they even wear buttons stating, for instance, Chicago is reading To Kill a Mockingbird. I would love to know what Bangalore or Cochin or Delhi might choose to use to read and what this would do to Indian book sales. There is another recent phenomenon in the West, an explosion of reading circles. Small groups of people meet to discuss a book every month. Today in America and Britain, these reading circles have become a very active form of socializing. And to me, again, they seem, some, they seem tailor made for Indian conditions. When I was a child, most of us bought our books from booksellers sitting on the pavement. Actual bookstores were very rare. Now there are bookstores in every market complex in the Indian cities, and the first Indian book chains have just begun. The speed with which even this could change should never be underestimated. It has already happened in America. 10 years ago, I watched the big bookstore chains overwhelm the independent bookstores, and they did this quite cynically. Small independent stores would find massive bookstores owned by, say, Barnes & Noble, or one of the other chains opening up right opposite them to force them out of business by selling books at discount prices. Sure enough, within a few, within a few years, the small bookstores were going bankrupt. Around that time, I was offered initial shares in a company just created by someone who had spent a lifetime in finance. Now he had a new idea. He wanted to move from finance to selling books and he wanted to do it on the internet. Alas, I didn't take up the share offer. I just didn't think it had a big future. Now, how wrong could I be? Uh, the man's name was Jeff Bezos, and uh, the idea was Amazon.com, today the world's largest book retailer. And those same book chains that put small bookstores out of business are now fighting off Amazon.com through their own internet sales. The velocity with which things are evolving 
And the capacity to keep pace with that evolution is something that is going to challenge everyone, not just publishers in the coming decades. The only constant in all that flux will be India's soft power. I can define in one word what I consider to be India's soft power, population. To me, it represents a massive number of potential new readers. What turns this soft power into a power of strength is one outstanding fact. Half of India's population is under the age of 25. The really exciting challenge before us today is this. Can we make them into book addicts? Can we succeed in defying the conventional wisdom of our century, namely that less and less people will want to read and ensure that India becomes a nation of readers and thinkers that will make her the envy of the world. I think it's possible. After all, Indians may have become familiar with the information highway, but they have not yet lost the longing to read. Most important, they want their children to read. And how can I, as a publisher, exploit all that soft power? Well, I see my job as first producing books then finding constantly creative means of seducing millions and millions of individuals into buying these books so that they can share in the unparalleled pleasure of reading, so they can gain the power to convert more information into knowledge and wisdom, so they can continue to play the greatest of India's traditional games, namely expanding the boundaries of human thought. And in this way, make sure that India today truly, and make sure that India truly is a country not only with a great past, but with a shining future. Thank you, and I'm sorry for those missing pages.